Hello, everybody. I'm Dr. Jason Howe. Uh, I am an associate professor of gastroenterology at Baylor College of Medicine. Uh, I'd like to welcome you to the DDW virtual roundtable on MedPage today. Uh, uh, we're really fortunate to be joined by two panelists uh, here today. Uh, Dr. Shirley cohen Meckelberg, she's assistant professor at the University of Michigan, as well as Dr. Jill Gatos, at, who's an associate professor at Yale University. Okay, so we'll be discussing uh, one, uh, one abstract, uh, focusing on things that are hopefully coming in the near future. Uh, this is one of what I think is a, an interesting phase three, results of a phase three tri clinical trial for Crohn's disease uh, for a medication called Rizankizumab. Uh, Rizankizumab is, is an interesting study. Um, this is, was both the, uh, were we discussing an abstract that was presented for both Advance and Motivate. Um, this study, uh, Rizankizumab is, a, is, a, is an interesting agent because it's similar to uh, medicines that we currently have available, ustekinumab, in that it is an inhibitor, a monoclonal antibody for interleukin-23, IL-23. Um, however, it's, it's a bit more selective instead of targeting uh, 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 the P40 subunit, uh, which blocks IL-12 and 23, like ustekinumab, this one focuses on the P19 subunit and therefore is selectively blocking IL-23 without interaction, or at least less so, with IL-12. Um, in other disease states, this mechanism has shown to be potentially beneficial. Um, so this is uh, uh, an agent that's uh, being, being studied for Crohn's disease. Uh, well, at least this abstract that we'll be discussing is, uh, is uh, we'll be discussing specifically in patients with moderate to severe Crohn's disease. Uh, these studies, there's parallel uh, studies called Advance and Motivate. Advance included both bio-naive and bio-exposed patients. Motivate was entirely patients who've been bio-exposed. Um, and again, it was a, a, a prospective uh, multi-center uh, uh, placebo-controlled uh, a randomized control trial. Each study um, had or were very sizable or with about six, 700 patients uh, receiving one, uh, one of the doses of rizankizumab in advance, about 400 patients uh, an active arm in Motivate, and have been another about 200 patients in placebo in each of those sub-studies. And Overall, fairly encouraging results that met its primary endpoint for both advance and motivate. Uh, Delta is around 20% in the primary endpoint. This study had a co-primary endpoint for both uh, with clinical remission uh, defined by the traditional CDIs we have for studies, as well as uh, the PRO2 uh, of uh, stool frequency and abdominal pain to define clinical remission, and as well as reaching its co-primary endpoint of endoscopic response at week 12, uh, again, in both advance and motivate. So encouraging findings and presentations for a new agent, again, similar but new, uh, similar to what we've ha we have available, but uh, importantly different. Um, curious for the panelists, how do you interpret this? What are some contexts that you would get from this study? And uh, what implications do you think this will have in our clinical practice in the near future? Um, Jason, I you know, agree with what you're saying, which is that the data is very encouraging. Um, you know, we are in need of new drugs for the treatment of Crohn's disease, uh, particularly. Um, you know, I think the data shows us that overall, this drug seems to have a good safety profile. Um, I think, you know, one of the questions I, that comes up, I think, in uh, reading about this trial so far and will be interesting to follow uh, when the manuscript comes out is, you know, with a similar mechanism of action to ustekinumab, uh, it, I know that they actually had a decent proportion of patients who had been uh, ustekinumab experienced who the trial. And so I think it'll be very interesting to see uh, how those patients did as compared to uh, ustekinumab naive patients. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I think there is, are questions obviously about maintenance, which I think is uh, to be determined and that data will hopefully come out in the coming year. Um, and I think, you know, one of the questions with this drug uh, kind of on the horizon is how would we position this drug and, you know, what would be the added benefit of rizinkizumab to ustekinumab, um, for example. Mm -hmm. oh, I agree. It's it's very encouraging. I think it's always nice to add to our options of treatment. 
because um, for those of us um, particularly working in academic centers where we see patients who've been through everything, having something new on the horizon that we can potentially treat our patients with is, is wonderful to have in our back pockets. I think um, one of the things that this study shows similar to other biologic agents is that patients who've been exposed um, to a biologic in the past don't respond quite as well, um, which I think is, you know, we're, maybe we still don't know if it's related to longer duration of disease, if it's just to, you know, changes in the drivers of their inflammation. Um, but, you know, again, our first drug is usually the one that we can, you know, have the best chance with. Um, and then we really try and do the best that we can with the ones that come after that. Um, another thing that's really encouraging is I would love to have another agent with a similar mechanism to use to Kinemab to potentially drive the cost down um, of use to Kinemab. Um, so that would really help to open up um, the market for our, our patients. Yeah, I think those are excellent points. I think the one thing you just mentioned, Dr. Gatos, is you know the duration of disease. Mm -hmm. You know, you know this this it, it, you know we co we're comparing advance and motivate kind of together. They're both like, in positive studies in terms of beating placebo responses. Numerically, were somewhat lower in motivate, but I would say compared to you know, we obviously obvious caveat, you can compare across trials. In some other agents we've seen before, we see a much larger decrement okay. in terms of response of uh, of of size of response or numbers of response response rates in patients who are bioexposed. They 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 were numerically lower, but I would say not much compared, not as much as mm -hmm. we've seen in, in other studies. It, you know, Advance was did have a mix of, a mix of both bioexposed and bio naive, but mm -hmm. actually the numbers we're looking for clinical remission. Advance was forty five. 0.2% versus, which was a 20% delta over placebo. Mm -hmm. Motivate was 42.5 compared to the 19% placebo. Um, so not not a huge drop. And mm -hmm. again, uh, it will be interesting to see as that gets uh, studied and, uh, a little further when they split out some studies, some analysis of the advanced study, look comparing the bio-naive, bio-exposed mm -hmm. patients of how much of a difference that is. Um, but that's uh, what we would mm -hmm. not surprised yeah. by that, but not quite as much as I, we, at mm -hmm. least what we've seen in other studies. Yeah. I think the biggest difference that you see with this one is in the endoscopic response. And I think the, the question is, you know, with our Crohn's patients was maybe 12 weeks too early um, for some of the patients with longer duration of disease. But, um, but yeah, I think with the endoscopic remission or the response that they measured uh, it's a little bit different between the cohorts. And to follow up on a comment Dr. Cohen made earlier regarding mm -hmm. prior ustekinumab, I, I encourage that they included this population. Mm -hmm. in, in many trials that we're seeing, they just for power purposes, they exclude completely patients on prior exposure of the similar MOA. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, you know, I, actually the numbers were fairly sized, but almost 20% in, yeah. in Motivate, 20, 22 to 24% of patients in advance were prior ustekinumab exposed patients because I think you know, we've, it's, been, it's been used out for so many patients. That's going to be a key question is mm -hmm. if this continues to advance and is, is becomes available for clinical practice for us in Crohn's, how we position that for those patients. Does it have an impact? Does it not? I think we're already seeing already with ustekinumab. It's not behaving in the same ways from an immunogenicity standpoint as we've seen with TNF inhibitors. So it'll be additionally interesting to mm -hmm. see kind of as you go to other similar medicines, but different medicines, does that have the same impact as we've seen with TNF inhibitors when we have multiple drugs in the same class, same MOA? So I'm very encouraged they included that, mm -hmm. that population here. We'll of, of course, we'll be looking into the weeds uh, for some analysis as that data starts to roll out. Absolutely. And it'd be really nice to see what the, the reason for discontinuation of ustekinumab was that um, for, of the cohort that was included in the study, because it would be very different if they had responded, but then, you know, their insurance didn't cover or they lost insurance as compared to those who had been treated and um, subsequently lost response. Yeah, I think that is going to be one of the most interesting points to follow here from DDW. Mm -hmm. I'd like to thank our panelists, Dr. Cohen, Dr. Gatos, for this uh, great discussion. And uh, thank you, audience, for, for listening in for our discussion as well. And hopefully we'll see you on one of our other discussion topics. Thank you.